Grace and peace to you, beloved. Thank you for joining us here today. I am Reverend Dr. Stacy Cole Wilson, Executive Minister of Justice and Service. Glad to be here with our Seeds of Security Ministry of the Baltimore Washington Conference. As you know, our bishop is committed to the work of um, domestic violence, intimate partner violence prevention. And I'm joined here with some incredible individuals here today who also serve on the board, as well as attorney Josephia Rouse, who, is, who will offer a presentation in a few minutes. As soon as we get our slides up on the screen for you, we want to just orient you to the space, let you know that you are welcome here in this space. Uh, we welcome all of you here. We thank you for joining us for this time together. Again, you'll You'll see the Seats of Security as a ministry of the Baltimore Washington Conference. And so we'll tell you more about that along the way. Just want you to see the board members here who are part of this uh, work, this great work that we've committed to do together. Uh, Reverend Dr. Wanda Bynum Duckett, Carrie James, Lucinda Kent, Rick Ausler, Andrea Middleton King, Akita Pearson, Sandy Phillips, Stacey Cole Wilson, Linda Yost, and our bishop who's the visionary for this ministry, Bishop Latrell Miller Easterlin. And so again, we thank you. We have an agenda for you to hear today. Um, again, we wanna orient you to this space. There is a chat feature that it has been enabled for you. You're welcome to talk to us. We can see your comments and, and, and offer your questions. We will respond to them during the Q&A portion that you see on the agenda. Uh, after um, the agenda, we'll have the prayer there. Then uh, Attorney Rouse will offer her presentation. Uh, and then we'll go into the other resources as we've shared them. Again, thank you for being in this virtual space. We're glad you're here and um, just enjoy yourself. If I could have you take an attitude of prayer, loving and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise in all things, but today we especially thank you for our speaker, Josephia Rouse as she fights the battle to protect others from harm each and every day. Father God, we thank you for those who have taken time from their schedules to seek knowledge so they can better protect the people in their communities and to remind us that we do it for the least of these, that we do it for Christ. Lord, there are so many people who live in darkness because of abusive relationships. Loving God, help them to recognize that abuse can take many forms not just physical, but mental and verbal and emotional as well. May this webinar make each of us more able to enlighten those in the darkness and empower them to overcome the fear, the confusion, the powerlessness through the love of Christ. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we offer this prayer and command anything and everything that destroys a person's self-respect, self-worth and confidence and leaves them with feelings of low self-esteem and desperation to be removed from all relationships. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Owls Owsler. Thank you. Attorney Rouse, she, uh, before law school, she was a legal administrative specialist for the Department of Veterans Affairs for three years. Uh, she also was a general practitioner uh, she's worked in family law. She's considered to be a family law mediator and a best interest attorney. And it is our joy to welcome her into the space. If you'd love to learn more information about her, you can visit her website, josephialaw.com. You'll find that link in the chat. Uh, attorney Rouse, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So um, when I was introduced to speak today, I really wanted to talk about the things that I, I think um, are going to be most um, effective uh, when you are introduced to someone that is having a domestic violence in, um, incident. And one of the things that I, I know for a fact is that I feel like you have to have a few, um, a few kind of pointers, because from the period of time that a protective order can be granted from the period of time you hear it is usually a couple of hours, right? Um, so if someone has an incident, someone can immediately 24 seven go down to an, a commissioner's office or to a district courthouse and get a protective order. Um, there will be follow-up hearings within that week and weeks to come, but your reaction time is really gonna be uh, not a lot of time. So what I wanna go over today are really the top three things you may want to think about when 
saying, yes, you know, I, I think that this is a situation where I want to assist you with uh, going down and filing uh, a protective order. Um, so I'm going to talk about those three things, and then I'll talk to you about how do you get a protective order and, um, you know, what that process is. So let me, let me start off with that. So if there's an incident where someone comes to you and advises you that there has been a, an issue of abuse, you will go down to the local district courthouse, um, whatever their local district court, you can Google that or their, commis their commissioner's office. Um, I would suggest calling down first because in the age of COVID, there are special um, instructions that each commissioner's office and district courthouse will have. But usually there's gonna be a commissioner at the district courthouse or at the commissioner's office 24 seven. Um, once you Google that information and go down there, the individual can file for a protective order with the commissioner or with a judge. If it's during the daytime, you might be able to get a, a, a judge to hear the case. And that's gonna give them a interim protective order. That's gonna give them a lot, an ability to remove um, a perpetrator from a home, um, to give them custody of minor children until a temporary protective order um, is granted in a case, right? And so that's gonna take a couple of days uh, for that to occur. Once the temporary protective order occurs, um, the party will then again be able to have a stay away order from the home, um, have custody of minor children, um, and then a final protective order hearing will be scheduled. A final order, um, protective order hearing will also give individuals emergency family maintenance, which can be calculated as child support and temporary alimony. And it can also give um, the ability for that perpetrator to um, submit to the courts, to the police, I'm sorry, to the police, all of their guns and their weapons um, so that they no longer have access to any firearms. It will also give um, the victim in that case, the ability to receive the alimony, but also um, the ability to have a, an order that can last up to a year. Um, one of the concerns though, I believe when you, when you get a case is because you really don't wanna assess whether or not this is something that would amount to, to the need for a protective order to be granted. Um, and in the state of Maryland specifically, I can tell you that protective orders are granted fairly easily. So there's not a situation where you need to have, oh, she, you need to show bruises or you need to show you know, pictures of an event or you need to have a recording. As a matter of fact, Maryland is a state where you cannot record another person without their permission. You don't have to have a police report. You don't have to have a witness in order for a protective order to be granted. You just need to be a credible witness. And um, if someone comes and they deny, deny the abuse, I can tell you now that's not enough evidence to stop um, a protective order from being granted. So I say all of that to say, um, there is an almost immediate process that the court system has in place to ensure that people have immediate um, relief when they're dealing with a domestic violence situation. So where do we go from there? Because we know that once a protective order is granted in a case, that that's gonna have a lot of effect on that family. Whether or not there's gonna be a pending divorce after, or if someone has a security clearance and they now have a domestic violence um, order against them. Um, so at this point, you know, especially if you're going into the area of divorce, or if you're going into the area of someone saying that their employment is, is being, um, I don't want to say challenge, but if you, we're in the DMV area, so a lot of individuals, they have security clearances. Um, if they are looking for a new job or they're going for a promotion, they're going to get a background check. I mean, it's the environment in which we live in. Um, and a lot of jobs, not only federal jobs, but the data security jobs, you know, the, I think Virginia, especially, they have so many jobs um, with IT and security. Um, and so background checks for some individuals in the DMV area, they happen almost every three months, right? Uh, so what happens is that after someone is granted a protective order and things kind of cool down, you can seek the advice of counsel or they can come to you and say, hey, we've settled things, right? So they always have the opportunity to do what's called a motion to modify or a motion to rescind the order. 
where they the, the protective order can be pulled and you can follow pulled from the um, records and it can be closed out or canceled. And then you can later file a motion to shield the case. Um, and I think that's a decision that um, I think is important to know that it doesn't have to last the entire year, especially when you have an incident where we've had a lot, lots of incidences where, you know, an incident has happened, someone knows that they're going to get a divorce, and the person may leave, go to another state with their family. So they're not necessarily afraid of an event happening because the person doesn't have that, um, there's a gap in space, right, um, for there to be an event. And, and in those cases, you know, we have found it appropriate to rescind a protective order so that an individual can continue to work and get promotions and provide for the minor children. Um, so though, I think those are the main things that I think are important for you to, to consider and think about when someone is coming to you with a domestic violence incident is that number one, the relief is almost immediate. They have to go to multiple hearings Again, that interim, that temporary, and that final. And when they're going to those multiple hearings, as the stages continue, they get um, increased levels of um, relief, right? Um, whether or not that's child support or removal of an individual, removal of weapons, and of course, um, the extension of time to be up to a year that they will have the protective order. Again, it's very easy to get if someone comes to you and they say, I don't have any pictures, I don't have a police report. I didn't call. You know, it was more than 30 days. Um, you know, there are specific reasons why a protective order can still be granted, um, even in that case. So we don't want to discourage people. Well, you know, if you don't have pictures, if you don't have evidence, you're not going to get a protective order because the commissioners and the judges, they are very lenient with the proof level for a protective order. And again, lastly, um, if the situation is appropriate based on, you know, the situation at hand, I've had situations where individuals have gone through counseling. So whatever issue they had, you know, they were able to resolve it. And when I say counseling, that may be, you know, alcohol anonymous or, you know, opioid counseling or, you know, that opioid treatment, I'm sorry. And they've gone through that process, right? And then that didn't last the entire year. And so we found that it was appropriate to rescind or modify a protective order. So there are some options after you've immediately gotten um, a call or a request for a protective order that don't always have to last a full year and don't always have to affect employment. But as with anything, you know, you cannot save a situation. You just have to do the best you can with the information that you've immediately received. Thank you, Attorney Rouse. Uh, are there any questions from those here gathered in the space with us? If so, we'd love for you to place them in the chat. Um, you've heard uh, Attorney Rouse talk about the difference between a protective order and a peace order. She talked about the level of or the burden of proof that is needed for the protective, protective order being um, pretty minimal in that you do not have to readily have bruises to show. It can be beyond 30 days. She also said that you still want to um, get that granted and that there, there are um, ways that, that, that you can get what is needed in, in a time that is pretty expedient. One of the questions is what happens, let me here pull, pull it here, what happens when the person violates the protective order? A, a violation of a protect, protective order is a criminal matter. And so in some counties, depends on the smaller counties, they'll, they'll put it together, but the bigger counties, they'll have a criminal case and you'll have a civil case. Um, but it depends on what it is. I've had individual, the violation of the protective order has, has to violate it to a level that makes sense. Because we have individuals in intimate relationships and say, for instance, minor children are involved and there's no contact. But if you're late and you text, I'm late to pick up. I've had people violate a protective order, even though we have a custody, you know, a custody situation. When we go to court, the court is like, well, you want her not to tell you you're late? You know, it, it, you technically, you can technically to the letter of the law violate a protective order. Um, but if you violate it with a physical act of abuse, that's a criminal matter. Or if you um, harass someone, or if you, and when I say harass, you know, continue your um, mental and, and, and um, emotional abuse of a person, it can definitely land you in jail. I believe it's up to a year. I'm pretty, 
but if it's connected with, so it's up to a year for the violation of the protective order. And then if there's an underlying criminal act, like an assault that has a separate period of time for um, as far as criminal charges are concerned. Um, and, I, and I think what happens with a violation of a protective order, um, a lot of times people don't wanna violate um, a protective order, but you, you have to, I always tell my young ladies who have gone through, or young men who have gone through um, the cycle of domestic violence is that it's not just about the act itself. Sometimes it's about control and you have to let someone know that they're no longer able to control you with the split. And sometimes a violation of protective order, like you, again, you file it and when you get there, if they're represented by an attorney, you guys can talk it through, that's fine. But individuals have to know to take it seriously and they have to know that they're gonna be speaking to a judge and they're gonna to have to talk about their conduct um, because that's one of the issues. Your conduct was wrong and you need to be held accountable for it no matter how long you've been doing that conduct and we've been able to resolve it within the marriage, that conduct is no longer gonna be tolerated. So um, violation is a criminal matter and it's also important for people to understand you need to do the violation so that an individual is, is being held to consequence um, for their actions. Thank you, thank you. Another question is, can a youth in our church youth group get a protective order on someone at school? So under the age of 18, someone, it's, it's going to be individuals over the age of 18, if you're or 17. If you're under the age of 17, a protective order is just for an adult. So um, if you have that situation, and let me just pull it up, because I've never done a protective order for an underage person. Give me one second. Because I know for an individual under the age of 18, an adult has to, we always file on behalf. So the parent files on behalf of the child, but I don't think you can file against a minor child. I think that goes to Department of Juvenile Justice. Yeah, it has to be an adult that's being filed against. Um, that's gonna go to Department of Juvenile Justice when we talk about minor children. But if the youth um, is 18 that is committing the act and the minor is 17, then a, an adult can go and file a protective order against the other youth. But otherwise you're gonna call the police and you're gonna you know, get Department of Juvenile Justice involved. Thank you. What about relatives um, uh, for a, a brother in the house or- um, So that's the difference between a protective and a peace order. Mm -hmm. Peace orders are for individuals not related by blood, marriage, or have a minor child in common, mm -hmm. whereas peace orders are for, yeah, peace orders, you don't have a relationship. Protective orders, you have that blood, marriage, or child in common relationship. Um, so if, if, it, if it's a sexual relationship, a marriage, or, you know, they live in the home um, with you and you're related to them, it's gonna be a protective order. During COVID, have you noticed any difficulties at all or changes? I think you said during COVID, have I recognized any changes to protective orders? Yes. yes. There have been a lot more protective orders, unfortunately, filed um, and, and that I guess, and that's maybe a year ago, how can it be rescinded? Probably would not have been a part of my presentation. Um, but I think we all are dealing with people who have been stressed out. And, and it's not, I, it's one of those things that is, is, as a society, you know, I think we have to grapple with because um, we recognize that the mental health of everyone has been strained during this period of time. Um, and that's, it's definitely been um, indicative of the uptick of protective orders. Um, and it's unfortunate because when you hear the arguments, the arguments are not what I'm used to, you know, adultery or something of that nature. The arguments are based on the stimulus check. The arguments are based on um, whether or not someone in another household is adhering to 
the mask requirements? Or are you going to places that adhere to the mask requirement? I mean, these conversations are just really, really um, volatile right now. Um, so COVID has caused a change um, in divorces too, unfortunately. I, I feel like there's been an uptick of divorces as well. Um, but you, that's why <clears throat> we do offer, you know, I try to always proffer counseling during a divorce. Um, and a lot of times if you proffer, you know, reunification therapy between the children and the parent during this period of time, people are able to get out those other issues um, at the same time that they're dealing with the, the domestic violence situation. Thank you. Are there any associated costs that we should be in, um, aware of? Protective orders are free. Peace orders are under a hundred bucks. Hold on one second. I hardly do any peace orders, but peace orders are like 80 bucks or $61 or something like that. I have my little sheet up. It's $46 uh, for a filing fee for a peace order and $40 for the service fee. So it's $86. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one of the questions, are there any recommendations you can share with faith leaders who may have a parishioner who, who's filed a peace order against another church member? Or, or a protective, protective order. Gotcha. Um, you know, peace orders, I, in my experience, have mainly been neighbors or individuals who have disagreements and really my personal opinion, um, especially when they're part of a community or group, they really want people to take sides. <laughs> like they wanna talk about it and they wanna have, you know, someone to have conversations about it. And they, you know, just like, and I've, I've had to go to the law and, and things of that nature. Um, and so my, and usually it's, a, it's regarding harassment, you know, I'm, most of the time. Um, and my biggest, thing is going to be, I can't give you legal, legal advice. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice and I can't tell you whether or not you're right or wrong under the law. You're going to have to get that resource from someone else. I can, I would suggest I can pray for you. I can try to help you in that way. Um, but an attorney is best, um, suited to tell you or give you recommendations about the law part, because a lot of times I feel like people just, they just try to pull you into the conflict because of course, if they've already gotten the peace order, you know, you just want me to know how kind of bad this person is. And um, I've been working on my mindset a lot this year because being in um, inside a lot, you just have to think about the positives and everything good that's coming out of a situation. So, you know, I'm solution focused, you know, what is the solution to that problem? How do you want me to help you with that problem? And if I can't help you with that problem. Let's talk about the resources that are out there that are better suited um, to help you um, with that issue. And just keep it, just keep it above board because they'll, you know, people will bring you, pull you into it all. <laughs> they'll pull you into it all. Thank you. Any other questions from our panelists? Well, very good. We thank you, Attorney Rouse, for your time here with us. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. I don't see it. Yes. Yeah. We'll make sure, again, that you have uh, Attorney Rouse's information. Uh, it is Josephia, um, dot Law. Is that right? Josephia Law. Wait a minute. Let me make sure I'm giving it Yeah, right. JosephiaLaw.com. JosephiaLaw.com. Yes. Yes. So again, thank you again. And we thank Dr. Akita for inviting you to be here with us today. Blessing. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So at this time, yeah. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye so now. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we invite you to just continue journey with us. We want to talk about United Methodist resources that are available to you um, here through the Baltimore Washington Conference Seeds of Security. If you, if you visit our website, bwcumc.org, slash SOS, you'll see some of the resources. And we have here Rick Osler, who's gonna kind of walk you through what some of those resources are. Um, but I just wanna show you on this next slide here um, is what you'll see when you go to the website. Okay, thank you. Rick, turn it over to you. That's great, Stacy. We, we actually had talked, but we hadn't completely coordinated that. And I was worrying about sharing screen because everything is, is kind of right there. 
So when when you get to that part of our website of the conference of the of the website, the first thing you're going to see is there's a there's a guidelines for the emergency fund. So if you're just interested and you were just curious as to how the money's spent or how it goes about, you can go there. Or if you're wondering if your situation applies, then you can find information there on that, and those questions are going to be answered there. Um, you're also going to have a link that you can click for an email contact for help where you will get one of us on the team someone on the team will respond to to that all right and we're um some someone helped me out but i think we're obligated to get to that like within hours and i, I don't remember the exact number the number but uh it won't be a 48 hour wait you, you can trust that um with also, once you're on the page, then you also have you, you you have access to the application for the emergency fund. So now you know that you have someone who qualifies and they and they need the funds and they get there. You can fill out that application online. All right, and and it is right there. Uh, there's even a, a separation whether it's going to be a short term or a long term um, event. For those of you who are just looking for information, maybe, maybe to share in church, especially now since we are getting back, maybe you'll print bulletins again. I haven't decided yet if that's a, a challenge I'm going to take on yet or not. But um, there are bulletin inserts on the page. So you can go there, click, click, click them. They're, they're already side by side. Uh, so you, you got two on a page. You, you can print them out. Uh, and there's basic facts about uh, DV or, or, and uh, you could put that in the bulletin for a week. Um, and then well, what is DV? That's another insert that we have. Uh, there are various examples and sometimes maybe as, as clergy and neighbors, friends, maybe that's one of the toughest lessons that we have to get across is this understanding of, uh, yes, uh, it is IPV, even though no one punched you in in uh, the face, it 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 is that way. I've lived through that in aspects of my own family, where where people become very very Stockholm ish in a hurry. Uh, there's another bulletin and insert on examples of, of 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 that on what it is, and then examples, and then what is a healthy relationship. You can have an insert and put your bulletin on that, and then another one is on what is an abusive relationship like. And, and these things are often important to get it to uh, get out because we have folks in our, in our churches who may be in an abusive re relationship and they think that's just, well, it's just the way he or she is, you know, and I just have to live with it. And they, and they don't see it in the context of what's really, what's, what's really happening. And just those resources alone, they could be enough to bring someone out to, to be able to, uh, to uh, seek help. Uh, at the bottom of the page, and this is going to vary by county, which was one of our real real challenges to figure out how we get these resources here. But on the bottom of the page are a list of some of the resources in, in the area. The Susanna Wesley House is in, is in Baltimore. The Arundel House of Hope would be on the, Anor uh, the, the uh, county side. Uh, then we have the Marion House. So we have Sarah's House. And they're in multiple of the, uh, the uh, locations. Um, I know some of them are in, I know the one closest to my churches and my home is in Fort Meade. Um, Howard County, the, the, the uh, Coalition for, for Prevention of IPV, that's Dr. Akita at the bottom. They are wonderful, uh, you know, and because I spend more time ministering in Howard County, County uh, I've had close work with them. Uh, the same with, 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 with Hope Works. And, and Howard County is, I don't know if we're unique, but we have a good situation with all these organizations there. And what I would say is, and I talked to Dr. Keita about this a little bit, I, I don't wanna overload these other groups, but if you can't find a resource in your, in your own county, there's nothing wrong with calling a state level or another county and going, hey, I know I'm in Carroll and uh, I don't know where resources are and you're Howard, do you, do you, do you have a connection? If anybody would, there's a good chance that that that, that group would. Um, there, uh, there's a woman's law center number on there. And the other thing I heard when I heard uh, uh, Attorney Rouse say about the cost, a lot of times when you go through an agency, if cost is an issue, that could be part of the protective order. order. And in fairness, I would probably say that our SOS funds would also qualify. So if you need to get someone as a pastor or as a 
a leader in your church has to get someone into housing and you then have to have, have to get them a protective order order, uh, you could use the funds in that way too. Uh, those would uh, be, be some, some of those areas there. The, uh, the last one goes to our folks who asked about the youth particularly, and that's our relationship with the One Love, the, the uh, foundation. Um, we have had them at Rock um, and uh, pre-COVID obviously, but, 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 but we've had them there. Uh, they, uh, they have been at our meetings and shared, shared their, their outline of uh, material there. Uh, if, if there's an organization, organization I felt was pretty much in a good way in your face about IPV. And I think as clergy, as parents, as folks, I think we underestimate uh, the amount that our youth are involved in that. I, I have been amazed at talking to our youth, um, very, very dominating the uh, relationships. Uh, and for an old guy, it feels like, like I've gone back to 19... 40s or the or the 50s, uh, the 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 words that are used to refer to your girlfriend are derogatory, and the girls in our youth group were just supposed to accept that because that's the way it is. Uh, they need to learn that that's not acceptable, and because and the young men need to learn that that's not that's not acceptable. So those are the sources on our page that kind of gives them there. Others, if we have. Um, I, like I said, said uh, Dr. Keita is the, the real expert here. So um, I'll take questions or whatever we have. Thanks, Stacy. You're welcome. Thank you, Rick. Also, now I just want to share with you some of the additional resources from the United Methodist Church, um, just to make sure that you're aware of where they are, how to access them, what our social principles have to say about them, Book of Discipline. So I'm going to invite the slides to come back up so that we can share that information with you. There you see here at paragraph 161G, um, that means this is in our book of discipline, which is like the book of law for the United Methodist Church that we recognize that family violence and abuse in all its forms, verbal, psychological, physical, sexual, is detrimental to the covenant of the human community. We encourage the church to provide a safe environment, counsel and support for the victim or for those who've been offended, we'll say. While we deplore the actions of the abuser, we affirm that person to be in need of God's redeeming love. So that's one statement. Another resource is found in the book of resolutions. Uh, that's a, and, and it's quoted here. It's a, a title, I mean, an article entitled Eradicating Sexual and Gender-Based Violence. It was passed at our 2016 General Conference. It calls the entire church to raise awareness of sexual and gender-based violence. The resolution states that the church must re-examine the, the theological messages it communicates in light of the experiences of those experiencing sexual and gender-based violence. A part of our call as individuals and as a church is seeking to address the root causes of violence, working to eradicate it in, in its multiple forms and being God's instruments for the wholeness of affected, and I'm gonna expand this, um, of all of affected persons, including um, men, women, and children, right? Because we know this, this impacts all of us. And, and domestic violence is definitely not just gender specific. And, and, and to talk about domestic violence is essential for us to do and a great place for us to start the work. Just to have this conversation today is a gift for us to, to continue bringing awareness to domestic uh, violence, intimate partner violence prevention, ways that individuals can get help, uh, peace orders, protective orders, reaching for hotlines, connecting with join, um, um, one love. So I'll, I'll share some, with you some additional resources here. This one, we really wanna make sure you have. Um, these are called the Faith and Fact Cards. They have been drafted by what we call our General Board of Church and Societies, one of our general agencies of the church. And this is something that you can, um, you can download. We'll give you the link for that as well. And we'll also email all of these resources to you because we want you to know in your local congregation, like, you know, what are some scriptures that can 
can be used in a, in a way that does no harm. That's what we want to ensure, right? With all that we're doing, that we're not doing harm, that we're doing all the good that we can, and that we are remaining in love with God, as, as Reuben Job would say. So we see here, they have some scriptural references. What does the United Methodist Church say? So some of our statements, what do the facts say about this issue? And now what do you say? What can you say? How can you be an advocate? What can your church do? How, how you can mobilize? And with that said, I wanna go to the next slide so that you can see the United Methodist women of the, of the United Methodist Church are doing some incredible work in this area. You'll see on their website, and we'll also drop that in the chat, um, that they have um, on their website a whole my goodness, a whole suite of resources. There's a Bible study. There's a way for your church to take action. It's a, as you can see here, mobilize your church. They, we have a relationship with Faith Trust, the Faith Trust Institute. I'll show you that in a minute. But these are resources that can, they thank you, right? They, they have here uh, resources that you can point and click and get information that can be implemented in your congregation. They also have a link to a Bible study. Um, that I found, I, I found, I think it can be really, really helpful. Next slide, please. Here's information about the Faith Trust Institute. I invite you to please go and visit this website, faithtrustinstitute.org. You will see uh, classes that you can sign up for, training, DV 101, what it is. Um, what you can do, how you can prevent it, language that's been helpful, language that has not been helpful. Um, who are, are uh, those who are considered batters, what, the potential profiles, right? We know it could be any one of us. So, so it's so important um, to please take advantage of these resources as you are, 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 you are, as you are best able. Um, we'll also email them to you. Uh, and, and we just invite you to continue to um, to bring awareness to this issue. As we know, um, we are interrelated, interconnected people. We now just wanna share with you some local, some local resources. Uh, you heard Rick share some of them with uh, some of what we have, but this we have on the slide here is super important. Uh, of course, we know if you are in any imminent danger or perceive any imminent threat, we invite you to call 911 immediately. And I love the hotline.org, as you'll see, and that's why we have it here, just like it is on the screen. As if you go right back to that slide, please. Um, as you'll see, soon as you go to the website, you get this security alert. So if you find yourself in any, if someone is watching you, if, if you feel threatened by anyone in the room, there's an escape button that can immediately take you out. It's kind of a grayed out so you can't see it, but it's behind the white, it's, uh, it's an X that can immediately, and it erases any memory that you've been to the site. Um, and you can see here, there's a telephone number um, that you can call if you are in any way concerned about digital security. There are so many ways to ensure that you can get the help, that we can get the help that we need when we can, uh, um, that when we need it. There are plans there. You'll notice in our uh, Seeds of Security gift bags that we have in the Baltimore Washington Conference, if you need them, we invite you to ask for them. Um, you can just go to the website, uh, bwcumc.org slash SOS. You'll see our email address there. We'll, I'll also ask um, uh, Lucinda, Cindy, to drop that in the chat as well. Just want you to know you can request one of those swag bags. Uh, and those bags are prepaid, so there's no cost to you. We'll just have to invite you to come and pick it up. And in that bag, we have a, a booklet that will walk you through your escape plan, resources. Um, there are individuals here who place goodie bags and other things that could be essential for you uh, during this time of transition. We just want you to know that the Baltimore Washington Conference is in support of, of your safety. And we want to ensure that you have the resources that you need to, to be safe. Back to the slides, just want to share with you Uh, these other additional resources that you can find um, here uh, for domestic violence, just talking about its relation to the pandemic's specific reasons, um, of course, that we know uh, that folks um, can be experiencing increased levels of abuse and violence, right? Reduced access to resources, increased stress due to job loss or financial strain, a disconnection from social support systems. 
uh, dictating rules for the victim's behavior, uh, surveilling the behavior, withholding access to basic household necessities, isolation, all of these things we want to name so that if we, if we are aware of these things or we find one of our loved ones in a situation, or even if it's, uh, if, if it's, if it's us, right? That we, we can get the help that we need. And so the next slide here, this is, um, this is one of our Maryland resources. When you go to the next slide here, you'll get more information about Faith Trust, some of the classes, what they cover, um, curriculum for clergy and spiritual leaders that we really wanna make sure you are aware of. Um, you can click that, you can see the curriculum, you can see the objectives of the classes. Um, as you can see, healthy boundaries for clergy, spiritual teachers and lay leaders. Please, we invite you to share this information broadly with individuals in your local context. Share when your Bible studies. Also, there is a Bible study that, that we'll talk about in a minute, but just take advantage of these resources as best able because truly um, we, we are loving our neighbors well. Um, in doing this work. We can do that. We can love them well. Uh, the next slide, please. You heard Rick talk about the One Love, love Foundation from um, that, that started with Yardley Love. You know, she was abused by her, her boyfriend at the time. What we want to, um, to really convey in, in this information here is we know our young people um, are, are in, a, in vulnerable situations. And we want to ensure that they have resources that are tailored, designed for them. Uh, you see Relationship 101. Um, there are some culturally appropriate pieces, um, language appropriate pieces. Some of the pieces may seem a bit um, uh, beyond maybe, maybe even uh, an adult comfort level, but all of these pieces have been vetted. Um, they have been um, designed when we had uh, the One Love Foundation come out to what um, you heard Rick talk about, which is our youth retreat, uh, rock, uh, thousands of young people. We had them craft a message, a faith-centered message directly for our young people. So what we want you to know is if there are resources that you need, uh, that you need, please let us know. And we want to make sure that you have them so that uh, the young people in your life and other vulnerable adults can receive the information that is needed. Next slide. So with that said, we wanna just take your questions, any questions that you may have for us before we offer, um, and we do wanna thank you for joining us. We have those, those resources on the slide, but, but before that, we just wanna take any questions that you may have for those of us here on the panel. And, and to let you know that this is an expert panel. I know they may not say that themselves and they, they, they'll laugh at that, but every person on this panel has a story that they can share with you, people they've supported, um, their own stories. So thank you, Linda, I invite you. Um, I would like, would it be possible to go back to the slide with the United Methodist Women's Resources on it? I just wanted to point out one thing that would be very easy for folks in their churches to do if they haven't already. All right, the domestic violence um, poster on the bottom right is that orange and uh, it can be downloaded and it can be, um, what is it, plastic put on it um, and it can be posted in the bathrooms. Now it doesn't have to be just the women's bathroom, it can be in the men's as well or your unisex bathrooms and just so that it's there um, as, a, as a point of information. And there may be someone who needs that help. And that is something very easily done by uh, any church member, any, any church can post that. So that was my, my one thing I'd like to point out besides the plethora of things that you can read about um, at, at this website. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Linda. And right there where, where you were um, on that slide, there was a, a video um, in purple that says, I believe you. And it gives you language. My goodness, it gives us, it's, it's a video. It gives you language. It's a, a Bible study too. That was the Bible study piece that mm -hmm. I talked about earlier. So I invite you to also take a, take a look at that. Um, maybe the word is laminated. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get the word out, <laughs> laminated. Yeah, thank you, Linda. All right. Any, any others, any others on the panel, any last words you wanna share with folks here today? 
I invite you. With that said, friends, thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining the Seeds of Security webinar today. I, on behalf of all of these um, great people here who've joined us on this panel, we say thank you for your commitment to this work and for your continued prayers. Go in peace and may the peace of the Lord continue to be with you and share these resources with others. Uh, 911, the D National Domestic Hotline, 1-800-799-7233. The Crisis Text Hotline, you can text HOME, 741-741. The National Sexual Assault Hotline, 1-800-656-HOPE. And In Violence Against Women International, 509-684-9800. And again, blessings and thank you again for being here with us today. God bless you.